love that song. And I think it speaks so clearly to our needs right now. I think there's so much going on in this world. There has been so much turmoil. And there's been so much loneliness in this past year. And it's just a fantastic reminder that what we need, what we truly all need, is Jesus. Great song. I encourage you to listen to that maybe when you're feeling a little blue at home. Uh, It's by Fernando Ortega. I like that version quite a bit. Well, at this time, I'm going to take us right into some more worship because worship is not just when we sing to God, but it's also when we offer our praises and our prayers. So I've got Randy this morning, I think. Uh, looks like cause Charlotte's gone, so we're, um, not gone, but she's downstairs. So I'm going to have Randy pass the mic around. So if you would, raise your hand if you have a prayer request. That way people online who are streaming with us can hear those prayers or concerns or praises as well. Janet. Yes, we have a new great-grandson on New Year's Eve, Daniel Andrew Cooper, 8 pounds and 15 ounces. Awesome. In Arizona. Great-grandchild, you said? Congratulations. Right over there. I'd just like to be so very grateful and give praise that Kara came through her surgery and that she feels very good and things are going great. Thank you for the update. That's good. This is a praise. My granddaughter, Hannah, is doing much better and should be returning to work this Friday. Awesome. Thank you. <coughs> okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and let's turn our attention to the Lord right now. Give him thanks for these things and just in general invite him uh, into our time of worship as we go into the message. So God, we just invite you into this time. Lord, we, we have welcomed you. Hopefully all of us, um, Lord, have been um, just aware of your presence since we've woken up this morning. But uh, Lord, I know that I had um, other things, I'm sure, on my mind and things that, you know, even that have to do with your church and the business of, of ministry. And God, it's good to just take a moment for all of us, including myself, to just turn my attention to you and say, God, come into this time. We welcome you into our service. God, we ask that you would just continue to work in our lives. God, we're thankful for for Hannah. God, we're thankful for what you're doing in Kara's life. We're thankful, God, for Daniel. Lord, we are just thankful for life and for these lives and what you're doing in each of them. We're thankful, God, for new life. We're thankful, God, for a second chance at life. God, we are thankful for life. And Lord, we are so thankful for how you work in our, in our hearts and our minds. And God, we are looking forward to what you do this morning, not just in our time here as we look at your word, but God, also in our time afterwards as we fellowship and as we get into just a uh, planning and looking at our our purposes of the church for 2021. So God, we love you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, let's see here. If I do this right here, Randy. Ah. Here we go. Maybe. You did it, Randy. You're so good. All right. So here we are. 
back in Colossians, another week, chapter 2. I'm excited. I'm excited to do a recap of where we've been and then to dive in to where we're going to today. So where have we been? Where were we last week? So last week was kind of an interesting week because we weren't able to live stream like we hoped. We weren't even able to record it like we hoped. So I'm going to give a, a fairly thorough recap of where we were last week for those who maybe missed it and were unable to be here in person and are going to catch up this week or in the weeks to come. So here we go. Where were we last week? One of the main reasons Paul wrote this letter was to ensure that Christians in Colossae did not give up on the essentials of the faith and that they would stay committed to the gospel. And they wouldn't get mixed up with beliefs that were being shared and passed around by others. In fact, Paul wanted the church there in Colossae and the surrounding churches to just stick, right? To stay committed to the faith, the essentials of the faith, and to Christ. You see, certain people were borrowing beliefs from uh, the Jewish faith and from what would later be known as Gnostic thinking, and they were beginning to share these things in these Christian gatherings. And they were influenced primarily by Plato. And Plato's thought was that the physical, material world was bad or evil, and the spiritual world was good. And, of course, that made it where what Christianity teaches a little bit of an opposition, right? Because the idea of the Gnostic type thinking was that you needed to abstain from all physical pleasure, whatever it was. You needed to you know, limit the amount of food you ate or the, what you would drink or how much sleep you got. You abstained from sex, all of it. You were what people would call living a life of asceticism. And they said, Christianity said, and Paul said, no, that's not good. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the God of the, the Bible. So let me get us here to our first slide. It's coming up here. Let's go to slide two, I think. Maybe not. Well, as Randy comes back, I'll get it showing that it should be coming, but I'm not sure why. Colossians chapter two, slide two. That's all right. As, it, as it's coming, Randy's rescuing me. I'm going to just, yeah. Uh, go to the uh, second slide, Randy, if there is should be the general Gnostic beliefs. All my slides up here are shown blank, but I don't know why. Um, so the general Gnostic beliefs here is listed out. First we got here, God of the universe is distant. So when it came to Gnostic type thinking, it was saying that the God of the universe is distant. Doing a little switch here. Thanks, Russ. Thank you. Um, and that the God of the universe created lesser spiritual beings. One of these spiritual uh, beings or spirits, if you will, rebelled against the God of the universe and created the material world. Which means from the get-go, the, the physical material world was bad. And so then another spirit had to come and save this world. And of course, this salvation was by people gaining this special knowledge, this secret knowledge that would set their soul free from their evil physical body and their soul would go back up and be in the spiritual realm. And we talked about how Christians can be guilty of this kind of thinking, making the physical world bad and the spiritual world good. Remember, the demonic spiritual realm is real, and it's not good, right? And God created our physical bodies. Though they're affected by the fall, they are still good. And it's tricky, right? Because the Bible uses words like earth and world and flesh to sometimes represent evil, depending on the context. Let me give you an example. We, last week didn't look at this, but let me give you a couple of examples here. Here's our first one. First John... 215. Let's check out this verse together. Love not the world. Love not the world. 
Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Does that make sense? Because Jesus says, and we said this last week, for God so what? Love the world. So God can love the world, but we can't love the world? What's going on here? Remember, it's all about how that word world is used in context. In this sense, John, the writer, in his letter says, don't love the sin of the world. Don't get caught up with the things in this world and make them into idols, which is a focus of this letter. He says, no, don't love those things. In the context, he's talking about world in that way. How about this one? How about the word flesh? Oh, my flesh. If I could just get rid of my flesh. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. What does he mean? Flesh here is speaking of what? Our sin nature. He's not saying your physical bodies or my physical body is evil, but that there is a sin nature in us. So that's where it can then sometimes be confusing for Christians too. As we read through the Bible, we begin to think, well, man, the physical material world is just not good. No, God made this world. He made our bodies. Yes, we are in a fallen state, but we're still good. And what God created in the beginning was good. So in Colossians, Chapter 1, Paul combats this Gnostic thinking. He says, you don't need to join some creative group to gain special, deeper knowledge. Rather, Colossians 1.9 says this. Check it out. This was last week. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He says, God has all the knowledge and wisdom you need, right? And if people try and tell you that the God of the universe is remote and that the physical world is bad, you just need to remember Colossians 1, 13 through 15. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is what? What does it say? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And we talked about last week, firstborn. I think this was a clever hook by Paul. Paul is pushing back against Gnostic thinking, and he throws out firstborn, which would have caught their attention. And he's saying, no, the more you learn about the Christian faith, you're going to discover that Jesus wasn't created Rather, he's part of the Trinity. This is just referring to his supreme status, right? His supreme status. Because remember, in the Bible uh, times, the firstborn got it all. Or at least they got the greatest portion. And what the father had to give came down to that firstborn. Or mostly what he had was given to the firstborn. Well, no doubt Jesus, the son of God, has been given supreme status like nobody else who's been physically born in this world. Even though he's eternal, right? We just came off Christmas, so that should make sense in our minds. So Paul goes on in chapter 1 to affirm Jesus' superiority. In fact, he says Jesus is the God of the universe in the flesh. Moreover, Jesus' physical death on the cross and bodily resurrection are paramount to the core of Christian belief. Check out Colossians 1, 18 through 20. He is also the head of the body, speaking of Jesus, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Talk about how he pushed back on the physical being bad. He keeps referring over and over Jesus and his physical body, his bodily resurrection, and God being in Jesus' physical body. All those things are saying the physical world is not all bad. Paul closed chapter 1 by saying that, in fact, God is so intimate, the God of the universe is so intimate, 
that the Spirit of Jesus, i.e. the Holy Spirit, makes his home inside of our physical bodies. What? Think about that. Colossians 1.27, for Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ's Spirit, like I said, the Holy Spirit lives in you. The God of the universe. And Paul says, you want to talk about a mystery? Don't listen to the Gnostic thinking that's telling you they've got the secret uh, knowledge and there's a mystery that you need to pursue. He says, the mystery is that the God of the universe lives inside of your physical body and mind if you believe in him. That's an incredible mystery, Paul says. All right, so with that summary, I'm going to tell you where we're headed today. All right, so with um, our focus that being on chapter 2 today, we're going to be really driving home Paul's emphasis on maturity. Paul. Paul's doing in chapter 2. In fact, it's not only. Christian beliefs. Take us there. This is where saying we proclaim him, speaking of Jesus, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, right? There's another pushback there on Gnostic thinking, so that we may present everyone what? mature in Christ. I labor for this, Paul says, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. You see, Paul emphasizes maturity. And a sign of maturity is that we as Christians stay committed to the essentials of the faith and to Jesus. Let me read this all the way through to Colossians 2.5. So we proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul says, I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, for those in Laodicea, nearby city, and for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. In him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. I am saying this that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. For I may be absent in body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the strength of your faith in Christ. Notice in these verses how Paul continues to combat the seabed of Gnostic thinking. However, there's more to those verses we just looked at than meets the eye. The focus Paul had is the focus we should have. Let me take you to that slide here. Paul's focus in these verses, check it out. He was struggling to what? Ensure that their hearts were encouraged and united in love. Anybody think that this last week was kind of an unusual week in our nation? In our country, it was a little bit unusual. We continue to see things unfolding that are a little unsettling and, and sobering. And it's, of course, hard to know truly in some ways what's going on. I feel like sometimes the mainstream media seems a little one-sided. And, of course, all of this political unrest is doing what? It's fueling hate and distrust among American people. Can I say that again? 
all this political unrest just fuels hate and distrust among the American people. Now, you take that and you combine it with all of the difficulties that a lengthy global pandemic has to offer, and it's not hard to see how people in our country and around the world can be incredibly disheartened and desperate right now. In fact, at one point this week, my wife just said, I just need some hope. Anybody feel like my wife this week? As you look at all this, you think, man, our country just needs some hope. I personally just need some, give me some good news. <laughs> give me something, give me some hope. And I think more than once I've either had this thought or uttered these words, what do we do? What do we even do? Well, let me let the word of God and the life of Paul inspire us this morning. Paul was working hard to minister to churches all over to ensure that they understood the fundamentals of the Christian faith and that they would just stick to Christ. Question for everyone. You don't have to really answer. I know if my son was here, he would try. My oldest boy always want to ask a question. He's quick to respond. Um, where was Paul when he was writing this letter? Anybody know? Yeah, I heard it. He was in prison. So Paul is in prison writing this letter. He's bound in chains, and he discovers that there, uh, through probably networking, that this fledgling church or churches in the Colossae area in Laodicea are now being visited by people or maybe people within their churches are given these plausible arguments that Jesus may not be enough, that there's more to salvation or God's wisdom than what Jesus offers. Now, no doubt Paul is used to putting out fires, but could you imagine Paul? He's like, man, I'm in chains right now. I can't go and be in person like I want to, and now I hear of this kind of Gnostic type thinking and some Jewish sort of tradition rising up, and I'm really concerned about my, my people, God's people, understanding what's right and what's true. And so what does Paul do? He writes a letter, and in this letter he stresses that Christians need to strive for maturity in their faith. And if you think about it, all of the letter, Paul's whole letter serves as an example to us of what it looks like to be a mature Christian and what it looks like to spur others on to Christian maturity. Let me say something. I want to get everyone's attention right here. Let me get your attention. We, even those online here, we need mature Christians in this world like never before. You hearing me? Church, are you hearing me? We need mature Christians like never before in this world. You see, Paul could have easily spent his time in prison frustrated by the things that were outside of his control. You ever do that? Get frustrated by things and you realize, man, it's out of my control anyway. But instead, he toiled and struggled with all the energy God so powerfully worked in him to make a difference in the body of Christ. Christians, are you and I doing that? You tracking with me? Are you toiling with all of the might and power that God works mightily in you? Am I doing this to make a difference in the body of Christ? Paul had that dual focus. He wanted to make sure that the hearts of those in the churches there that he was writing to were encouraged and united in love. Let's see Paul work here as an example for us to follow. Let me give you a specific example. How many of you got Facebook? You can show me, raise the hands. Facebook, Facebook, everyone. Anybody get on Facebook and see someone else who's a Christian put things on there that you're really frustrated with? Nobody. One person. Yeah, we do, right? We're like, come on, you're a Christian. Why'd you put that on there? Come on. 
let me encourage you to do what Paul does. Do something specific to encourage them. We often find ourselves not doing that. And I mean really thinking through how we can encourage them. I am not saying to encourage ungodly or anti-Christian thinking. I'm not saying agreeing to comments that you disagree with. I'm saying set aside the political stuff. I'm saying whatever the hot button issue is that you're disagreeing on, I'm saying lay that aside and ask God to help you build a bridge in that relationship. It's too easy to defriend. It's too easy to write something back when they're not even face-to-face. You can get way more passionate and bold when they're just a computer, right, in front of you. I'll say this to them. Look for a way, or you don't say anything at all. You're just frustrated by the comment, and you just say, "Ah, gosh, I can't believe they wrote that. What do you think the mature thing would be to do? Would be to build a bridge. Do you think Jesus built bridges? It's it's like a Sunday school question, right? He did. Jesus' driving force was love. Jesus' driving force was love. His primary motivation was love. Should not that be ours? Are we looking for ways to build bridges with those whom we disagree with? Are we looking for ways to specifically reach out and encourage those hearts so that we can be united in love? Now, you might be thinking, okay, Dan, but what do they think? I mean, what do people think when we reach out to them? They might be thinking, all right, all right. So you're reaching out to me, and you hold a more historical, orthodox view of the faith. I'm sort of drifting away with my thinking and my way of doing things, and it's likely that they're going to see your efforts to reach out to them as kind of arrogant. Oh, so you are the mature one. You're the one that has the monopoly on truth, and I know you're just trying to build this relationship with me to help me find my way. That might be what they're thinking. I know your motives. Let me ask you this question. Is it wrong to still build that bridge even if they think that might be your motive? Even if someone thinks, oh, you're just trying to get me to come more back to the essentials of the faith. That's okay. Deep down, if they have a love for Christ, they're going to love you for it. That's okay. Let me read to you um, Colossians 6 and 7. Paul says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. What do you think it means to walk in Jesus? It's kind of a weird, if you just take that all by itself, walk in Jesus. What do you think that might mean? Just as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in him. I picture that as a sign of maturity. If you've received Jesus, now go and walk out your faith in a mature way. Walk in Jesus. Be mature. We're told here, we need to stay rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as we are taught, overflowing with thankfulness. One of Jesus' most well-known parables is the parable of the farmer and the sower. Let me take you there. Luke. Luke, you ready? Who loves this parable? I love it. Such a profound teaching of Jesus. Jesus is, of course, in this parable, he tells about this farmer who goes out and he scatters seed, right? And seed falls 
on this path, we're told. It's scattered across this footpath, and we're told people step on it, and birds come and eat it. And then, of course, we find in Jesus' explanation of this that it represents this group of people who hear the message, who hear the word of God, but the devil essentially comes and stomps on it and takes it from their hearts to prevent them from believing and being saved. Then there's seed that's scattered on the rocks, but it has no depth of soil, so the roots can't grow up, um, or grow down rather, and help the plant to grow up and be healthy. And Jesus says this group represents those who hear the message. They're all excited about it. But when the time of temptation or persecution comes, they fall away. And then there's some seeds scattered among the thorns. But as the plants grow up, so do the thorns. And it chokes the fruitfulness of those plants. The fruitfulness of those plants. But then there's some seed that land on the good soil. They grow up plants grow up and they represent those who hear the word and the message of God with a good and virtuous heart and they hold on to the word of the message firmly in their hearts. This is the group we're told who endures and brings the fruit of their faith to maturity. Let me bring you to the other part. As for the seed that fell among the thorns, so here's the parable. These are the ones who when they have heard go on their way and are choked with the worries, the riches and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. Did you just hear that? Produce no mature fruit. The fruit never ripens. But the seed in the good ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it and by that endurance bear fruit. I love how this explanation in this final part of the parable answers this probably raised concern that we have of God's justice with the first group. Does anybody wonder about the first group? I mean, when you hear that first part, you're like, man, so some seed gets scattered. Essentially, the word of God gets scattered in the hearts of some people, but the devil comes quickly, stomps on that word, and takes it away so they can't be uh, saved. They can't believe. And you think, well, that's not fair. But if we read the entire parable, we understand what was going on with that first group. They never valued the word of God. They never held on to it. I'm sure Satan would want to do what he did with the first group with all four groups. It's not like that group was special and that God was like, yeah, those people aren't going to be saved. No, the point of this parable is that that's Satan's goal for every one of these groups. The first group just said, I have no real interest in this word that comes from God. I don't really value it. And it just slips away in their life. But the fourth group, we're told, hold on to it. They retain it. They hold fast to it in their minds. And they are fruitful. Church, hear me here. A sign of Christian maturity is that you and I hold fast to our faith. Even when it is tempting not to. When the pressures of our culture or the lies that are spun by certain groups that make it seem like the word of God promotes hate and bigotry, don't let the enemy stomp on the message that's been placed in your heart. You hearing me? Church, a sign of Christian maturity is to listen to the word of God and to Jesus when the call comes to question, what do we really want in life? I have these desires for other things. I'm finding myself worrying and I'm wanting these pleasures or maybe these riches. And I'm just finding myself wondering what to do. And he says here and what I'm saying, the Christian who is mature says, I will not go that way. I will retain what I know God's word says and I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to hold fast and I'm going to do what like Paul said in Colossians rooted. Where are you, Christian? Where am I? Are we rooted? Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, walk him, him. Be a mature Christian, rooted and built up in Christ and established in the faith, 
just as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Paul is saying right here, this is like the theme of Colossians summed up. Stick to it. Church, stick to Jesus. Walk in faith. Walk in him. Be a mature believer, rooted and built up in Jesus. Paul, in these verses, we see here in Colossians, he goes on to say, be careful that no one takes you captive. I like the way the NIV puts it here. I'm going to read it to you. I got it right here. The NIV puts it to... Eight, see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, meaning that not all philosophy is bad. The field of philosophy is not all bad, and Christians have much to learn and to appreciate from the field of philosophy. I like how the NIV puts that word in there. Don't be taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition based on the elemental forces of the world and not based on Christ. For in him, the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily. And you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. Clearly, Paul is pushing back on Gnostic thinking here. But Paul is also saying that Jesus is the finest answer to life's ultimate questions. Right? Church, a sign of Christian maturity is to see that we are complete in Christ. Let me say this clearly to people. Put this down here for a second. feel so far away being up here. But let me, I think it's good. I think it it does help with the focus of things um, as far as the screen and going back and forth on my face. Let me just say this. You are whole and complete in Christ. Sometimes I think we feel incomplete, especially if we're single. We can feel incomplete. Oh, if I had that girlfriend, if I had that boyfriend, if I had my spouse. A spouse is a beautiful, wonderful gift from God. And I know in this room, there are some people who recently lost their spouses. And you do feel like I'm incomplete. And that's okay. It's okay to feel that. And I understand that. In that feeling of having a hole inside of you only to a point. I don't fully understand what it's like to lose your loved one, your spouse. But at the same time, Jesus is saying you are also complete in me. That at this point you are not lacking something. Because either you've lost something or because you've never had it. People who have lived all their life and never married but wanted to are not incomplete. There is a wholeness that can be found in Christ. And that is what Paul is teaching here. And we need to hear that. We need that. Every person in our life, from spouse to children to friends, extended family, those are all gifts from God. But God is telling you and I, And I hope you recognize this, as hard as it can be, you are complete in Christ, individually. You are complete and whole in Christ. And Paul is teaching us that right here. And it's easy as we, hopefully you guys read through Colossians 2 before we got here, but it's easy as we read through this letter and any, you know, book in the Bible, we can blaze past these incredible, beautiful principles In the word of God, we are complete in Christ. In Christ, you have been brought to this fullness that no other power could compare to or be greater. The questions about how to live and and to live a fulfilled and purposeful life are answered, answered, excuse me, in Jesus. The questions of Does eternity or true love or forgiveness really exist? Well, those are answered in Jesus. In fact, the thought of the greatness of Christ and all that he has done for us is just bubbling up in Paul. 
to the point that we see that it's overflowing, and he just has to, it seems like, in these next several verses, reiterate the gospel. So in verses 11 through 15, I'm just going to read to you here, you're going to see that Paul just starts telling the gospel again. He says, in him you were also, also circumcised with a circumcision not done with hands. By putting off the body of flesh. There's that term, body of flesh, talking. You have been circumcised by God through Christ. And your circumcision is the sin nature in you. So that it no longer has this power over you. In the circumcision of the Messiah. Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave all your trespasses. He goes on to say, he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it out of the way by nailing it to what? The cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them by him. Brings up circumcision. We talked about this actually in our Christmas series, kind of ironically. Um, Obviously, Paul's talking about this figurative circumcision, but a circumcision nonetheless that is real and spiritual. And he says, again, you are being circumcised, not physically, but spiritually, in the sense that your sin nature is getting removed as you come to Christ. He says, remember that, Christians. In fact, even in Deuteronomy, this goes all the way back to good old Moses. Deuteronomy, we're told that God says to the Jewish people, you need to circumcise your stubborn hearts. This is what Paul is talking about. Your hearts need to be circumcised from that sin nature that just wages war within it. Right? And then he goes into baptism. Another great symbol, right, of just being made new in Christ. He says, essentially, Paul says, mature Christians recognize that Jesus performs this new life in us, right? We are buried. You know, when we watch someone be baptized, they go under the water, it represents their death. They come out and they're this new creation in Christ, And Paul says this is all done by the cross. We should never underestimate the power of the cross. Now, of course, Paul here, you see how he closes this thought? He says that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. What's he talking about? The spiritual realm that is against God? Because we do not fight against flesh and blood, right? As Ephesians says. But the spiritual powers and principalities of this world that are against God and his ways, but the cross made a public spectacle of them. You see, in Bible times, if a powerful nation came in and took over another nation, this is what they would do. They would take the rulers and authorities, they'd bring them out, and they'd publicly disgrace them. Not a good thing. It probably was a real bad thing. But Paul's taking that thought, and he's bringing it to Christ, and he says, this is what Christ has done against those spiritual powers that have tried to oppose God and his ways. He's made a public spectacle of them, but how did he do it? By dying on the cross. By humbly dying for us who were sinners. Beautiful, beautiful picture of God's grace, his mercy, his humility, his intimacy in his creation. What about verses 16 through 19? Paul goes on to say, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink, or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are the shadow of what was to come. The substance is Jesus, the Messiah. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm and inflated without cause by his or her fleshly mind, right? Paul clearly is pushing back on Gnostic thinking, also on some Jewish thinking. He says, man, you don't need to observe special rules and days to be in right standing with God. It's well and fine, you know, we have our traditions, we have our special days that we um, 
I guess, adhere to and, and we celebrate things on those days. And Paul says, it's all well and fine, but the substance is Christ. And he says, don't then let those things that people say you need to do to be in right standing with God disqualify you from what really is the substance, which is Christ. Notice something here. Twice now this morning, I have said that we need to cling to something. The Bible says we need to cling to something. Cling, to retain, to hold on to. Notice here, Paul says this. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetic practices in the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm and played without cause by his fleshly mind. Let me, uh, let me read to you in the NIV here. think verse 19 he doesn't hold on to the head the NIV says here he has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow its ligaments and tendons develops with growth from God Twice now the Bible has told us that we need to hold fast to things. Jesus said you need to hold firmly to the word of God to bear fruit that matures. Right? We looked at that in that parable. The fourth group, the seed that fell on the good soil, were those that retained the word of God and held it fast in their hearts. And we're here told that Paul says, you do not want to lose connection to the head of the body, which is Jesus. In fact, how does the Christian mature and grow? Paul says right here, right? By staying connected to Christ. Develops with growth from God. How does a Christian grow in a growth that is from God? They stay connected to Christ. They just stick. They stay committed to Christ and the essential teachings of the faith. Let me close up here with just a few final thoughts. Let's read verses 20 through 23 together. If you died with Christ, Paul goes on to say, to the elemental forces of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destroyed by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Hold up. If we just read those two verses and didn't read verse 23, that sounds like a license to do whatever we want. Doesn't it? I mean, look at that. Hey, don't let anyone tell you what to drink or what to taste, what to touch. Man, you could really play with that, couldn't you? Hey, Paul just said I can do these things. But we've got to keep the context in mind, right? Verse 23 helps to keep some boundaries on what Paul's saying. Although these have a reputation of wisdom promoting Ascetic practices, humility, and severe treatment of the body, they're not of any value against what? Really abstaining from sin. If you really want to curb self-indulgence or sinful desires, you got to do what? What's the answer? Paul gave us the answer throughout chapter 2. He says, in order to really resist sinful desires, you need to have wisdom and understanding that is boundless. And you and I don't have that. That comes from Christ. That's what Paul told us in chapter 2. That all of the wisdom and knowledge that is found in the world, it is boundless in Christ. Doesn't mean that Christ is going to give it all to us. But just that we can rest in that God is all powerful and all knowing and all wise. Also, we know that what really helps us to resist our sinful desires is that Christ has come and circumcised our hearts, taken that sin nature and its power that wars within us and says, no, you don't have to be controlled by that anymore. That power has been nailed to the cross. In other words, this is the action Jesus does that is truly valuable in helping us resist sinful desires to curb that self-indulgence. And when we have died with Christ, then we can confidently walk in his ways as a new creation in Christ. Anybody got a little bit of sin or guilt 
Anybody at all? Yeah. Yeah, we do. And Paul says that that spiritual debt, that sin, it was eradicated on the cross. Christians, we need to trust and live out these truths. This is how a Christian grows. We walk in Christ to be mature in Christ. All of us need to stay rooted and continue to be built up in Christ and established in the faith. That is what Paul was contending for in the second part of our series. Let's pray. Lord, so much. Your word offers so much. God, just remind us of the, the essentials and the takeaways, God, that are personal for us, that are specific to our lives. God, prick our hearts where, where, where it needs to be pricked. God, we need conviction. We need guidance. We need comfort. We need counsel. And we know that, Lord, your wisdom and your knowledge is boundless. And what you choose to reveal to us is up to you. But God, we are asking, I am asking, you would come and give us all wisdom and knowledge for things that are specific to what we're facing and going through. And God, help us to remember that you have circumcised our hearts, our stubborn hearts. That God, the sin nature that is in us doesn't have the power it once had. And so God, that we are now dead to our old way of living and we are living this new life in you. God, remind us of that, that we can walk confidently in your ways as mature Christians, that sin and guilt don't have to hold us down. God, help us to stay rooted and built up in your son. And we ask Jesus all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for those who were watching online today. It was a pleasure to be back, and hopefully the live stream went smooth for you. So thank you for that. And for those of you...